Um, I'm Heidi Waddy, for those of you who don't know, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who's uh, Janet Dickinson, uh, who is speaking about the lesser bluebird. Uh, <laughs> the lesser bluebird is related to a species that I know very well, eastern bluebirds. This is western bluebirds. One of the nice things that I can say about western bluebirds, much to my surprise and chagrin, they are likely the basil set Sialli. Do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, Janice is a, an amazing scholar, and I'm really happy that she's here. We got to talk about bluebirds and those things that are close to both of our hearts. She's got um, 29 years with bluebirds in the field, is that right? And um, that's just amazing. She knows a lot about these animals, and she studies them here in California, which is lovely around Peyton Hastings. And uh, so she gets to do it in a good environment. She is a professor <coughs> in the Department of Natural Resources and in the graduate field of neurobiology and behavior at Cornell. And she's been a professor there since uh, quite a while, I guess. 2005. <laughs> 2005. <laughs> and she also has had positions at Hastings and she had postdocs at, um, at um, Berkeley. She's, um, she got her PhD from Oh, Cornette. She got over 100 papers. Uh, many of them are about this uh, minor <coughs> paper. Uh, and uh, she had a number of honors that are worth knowing about. She's a fellow of the National Behavior Society of the California Academy of Sciences of the uh, Cornell Center for Sustainable Future, the AAAS. Um, and also that page for you. Um, and my organization is too, and I have two contracts in 2015. I had a remarkable award. The top, one of the top 10 insights of the year from the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. And so I asked her about this paper. And uh, I'm reading you the title because I think it speaks to Janice's diversity of interest and the name of this paper is How Framing Climate Change Influences Interest in Doing Something About It, the Journal of Environmental Education. So um, she's a conservation <coughs> biologist at Cornell. She's also somebody who works with the citizen sciences programs, and so she encourages that. And I know some of you are also interested in programs like that. Janice is somebody you should talk to. And I also want to know, I mentioned that she has a superior address to Paris in the following way. Your address at EED, UCLA, is 621 Charles and John South. Her address is South Sucker Woods Road. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Janice, for coming. Thank you, Patty, for that nice introduction. She's just jealous because my, my birds have adult helpers and hers don't. <laughs> so what I'm going to try to talk about today is the interface, and it's going to be, a, I, I'm trying to synthesize um, different areas of research that we've done over the years, the interface between mate choice and sexual selection and helping at the nest or cooperative breeding. So it's a, a sort of new synthesis and I'm welcome your feedback on it um, because I think you know at the moment it sort of points to where we might go next and the first thing I want to do is say we really means we and often it means they um, this work couldn't have been done without a large number of postgraduate interns work REU undergraduates, postdocs, graduate students and collaborators that we've had over the years and especially Walt Koenig who started putting out nest boxes at Hastings at, in 1983. So cooperative breeding is when you have more than two individuals helping at a single nest or taking care of young at a single nest. It occurs in 9% of bird species worldwide and a much higher percentage of species in Australia. And it's really varied in its forms. So you have species like the Florida scrub jay on the top left, where you have 
socially and genetically monogamous pairs that are aided by offspring from prior, prior years of both sexes. Species like top middle, the Seychelles warbler, where you have two females breeding at a nest. And they can either be a helper and a breeder or co-breeders, meaning they're both laying eggs in the nest. You have species like the plurally breeding Mexican jays, which live in large groups, have multiple nests, and then males will go around and feed at different nests where they have paternity. And then the superb fairy wren, which is highly cooperative, yet has one of the highest uh, rates of extra pair fertilization that you see in birds. And then you have the western bluebird, which is an occasional cooperative breeder, which means they consistently have helpers at the nest. Those helpers are males, and they're adult males, not juvenile males. Um, but they always have it at a low frequency. Recently, we've heard from Christy Reel in a very nice review that we've kind of overlooked helping among non-relatives. But I want to mention, even with her data in that paper, if you calculate the percentage, among species with helpers, at least 75% are species in which the birds only help relatives and don't help anybody else. And so that still suggests that with helping at the nest, kinship is an important phenomenon. Our work, all of our work, I think, in behavioral ecology has been greatly informed by G.C. Williams' adaptation and natural selection, really pointing out the importance of individual selection. But at the same time, we had this incredible paradigm shift with W.D. Hamilton coming on the scene with inclusive fitness theory and distilling that into a relatively simple equation and idea, Hamilton's rule. And essentially what he pointed out is that we can not only increase our representation of genes in or alleles in future generations, by having direct offspring. But to the extent that we help relatives produce additional offspring, we get credit for that as well. And that's the indirect component of inclusive fitness. So in order for cooperation to evolve, the benefit to the recipient times relatedness, which from Sewell Wright is the prob probability that alleles are identical by descent, has to be greater than the fitness cost for the actor. And that's driven a lot of the exploration of these kin-based helping systems over the years. This was preceded, of course, by J.B.S. Haldane's famous quip that he would give his life for two brothers or eight cousins. And you know, as you know, brothers are related by half and cousins by 0.125. So his calculus was correct from Hamilton's point of view. So I want to just go over very quickly how we do fitness accounting so that you'll understand this throughout the talk. When we're asking about the indirect fitness benefit of helping, that benefit that a helper gets by helping produce non-descendant kin. And so on the left side, you see a father and mother with a breeding son who has two offspring, and that's two offspring equivalents. But what Hamilton allowed us to do is say, OK, on the right side, we've got a father and mother, and they have not only the three offspring they produce on their own, but four additional offspring that they produced because the helper helped. And that helper gets credited with those offspring. And because he's related by half, just as he would be to his own kids, he gets four offspring equivalents. But what we more often see when we look at cooperative breeders in nature and species with helpers in particular is that they get less when they help. So in this case, one offspring equivalent compared to the two for breeding independently. And so this has caused the field to focus very heavily on the cost side of the equation. So we focused on ecological constraints and social constraints on independent breeding with a whole diversity of hypotheses that I'm not going to go into. But that's really where the main focus has been in the field over the years. So Western bluebirds, I've told you, are an occasional cooperative breeder. They're socially monogamous. Divorce is exceptionally rare. Incest almost never occurs and that's even when they are in close proximity. And we see extra pair fertilizations at 45% of nests. 
11% of the natal males, so the males born on the study area, help at the nests of relatives at some point in their lives. And then uh, we, about seven, on average, 7% 7 of pairs have a helper. So what I'm gonna do over the course of this talk is first I'll describe the basic mating system and the methods. Then I'll talk about sexual selection, extra pair paternity, and biparental care. I'll talk about our estimates of whether Western bluebirds meet Hamilton's rule and, and the, the reasons why they do or do not. I will talk about the social ecology of kin neighborhoods. And then I'll come back and talk about the counterintuitive counter effects of biases and extra pair fertilization and how that can influence the benefits of helping. So I don't know if any, has anybody <laughs> been to Hastings Reserve? Pretty good. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Um, and I lived there for 18 years. So I feel very privileged, but um, we've been working there since 1983. It's in the outer coast range of central California. And the study area for most of the years has been seven square kilometers with 360 nest boxes spread over the hills. And fewer than 35% of those boxes are occupied by bluebirds and they are the primary box occupant. So there are a lot of empty boxes out there. Allison actually knows this firsthand because she had to check them every week. Um, so, uh, so, and birds will have as many as seven boxes on their territories. These are year-round resident birds. And over the years, we've banded all the nestlings and adults. We've measured the nestlings on days six and 14 to have a more powerful data set for looking at developmental effects. And you know, this is all good for looking at recruitment and dispersal. And they can be sexed in the nest, which means we don't have to use molecular methods to sex them, which is quite nice. They have two steps of dispersal. So in late fall, late summer or early fall, they form winter groups. And those winter groups live on mistletoe-based territories. And mistletoe provides a constant berry supply over the whole winter. Then in spring, they break up and they, the uh, winter group members that didn't breed there the prior year, settle onto territories nearby or leave the study area entirely. And just as in most species of birds, we have female bias dispersal. And this is uh, something that was really uh, looked at in an innovative way by Greenwood and Greenwood and Harvey in the 80s, where they said that one sex should disperse farther than the other to avoid incest, but which sex should disperse should be determined by the relative fitness benefit cost ratios for the two sexes of staying home or staying nearer home. And what he suggested was that because birds are territorial and territories are so important to getting a mate, that males should be the ones to stay home. Whereas in many mammals, there are resources like burrow systems that might be more important to females. We have a case in support of this when we look at philopatric males compared to males that have immigrated into the study area. The white bars are immigrants, the black bars are birds born on the study area. And as you can see, for males on the left, both survival and reproductive success in the first year are higher for males that are born on the study area, where we see no difference for females. And when you look at winter group formation, what you see is that 70% of the first winter males in those winter groups are in their natal group with their parents. Only 6% are coming in from someplace else, so they're unbanded birds coming into the study area during that first step. For females, 51% are coming in and only 25% are wintering on their natal territory. And what happens in spring is those females that stayed in their natal group, 85% of them disappear and, and undergo a long-term dispersal step in the spring. 15% are around in the closest, in that sample anyway. The closest one was to its natal group was 1.8 kilometers. So they, they either go far in the fall or they go far in the spring, but it's, it's relatively rare to have the females sort of in, in kin neighborhoods near their parents. 
These winter groups are also an opportunity for sons to mate. These females come in and 61% of the sons will end up with a mate that joined their winter group. And then what they'll do is they'll settle nearby. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But that gives you a basic idea of their kind of annual cycle. The females do all the nest building and incubation. And then when they start um, about 10 days before laying while they're building the nest, the male starts following them closely, very similar to Patty's bluebirds. And we have strong evidence of mate guarding because when we detain a male for an hour, 86% of females have at least one and up to four males coming into the st onto the territory and attempting to copulate with them. And 68%, I'm sorry, coming onto the ter and six territory and 68% actually receive uh, at least one extra pair copulation attempt and up to 35 extra pair copulation attempts during that hour. When we just capture a male and release as a control, only one male came in and that male came in while I had the bird in my hand. I turned around and there he was, so he came in very quickly. <coughs> Females show behavioral preferences for males that are older than their, than their mates. So when extra males come in, we're able to look at female receptivity to these copulation attempts. And the bigger the age difference between the female's mate and the extra pair male, the higher proportion of these attempts she's accepting. So that suggests that females are preferring extra pair matings all else being equal, when their male, mate is not interfering, they're preferring extra pair matings with older males. And Amber Budden came and worked with me for a while, and she actually was able to show that there's age signal in the plumage, both in the top, the top, how blue the top of the head is, and in this ruddy patch on the back, which if you start at the top left and move down to the bottom right, you can see there's a gradual disappearance of this red patch. But there's also a lot of variability in that. We've since found that they can also tell the age of a bird by its vocalizations using vocal playback experiments of, of young and old birds. And that's a paper by Chalar Akchai. It's actually uh, not submitted yet. When we were finally got funding to look at the paternity, we were able to show that paternity also favors older males, but the age difference dropped out there. So it's no longer a matter of how much older the male is, but older males are more likely to have extra pair fertilizations. So this suggests that females prefer older males and that this is showing up in their paternity. So we wanted to look at differences between extra pair and within pair chicks. And we wanted to control for the hatch sequence because there could be, uh, you know, because you have five eggs laid in a nest, four to five eggs, the first ones may hatch first, those chicks may be larger for, for reasons of hatch order rather than genetics. So we weren't assuming that this is going to be genetic differences. So we actually uh, mapped eggs to chicks, and we found that extra pair chicks end up earlier in the hatch sequence and earlier in, in the laying sequence. Those, we had previously found that, that extra pair chicks were larger than within pair chicks, but when we look at this, the, the early hatching chicks certainly grow faster but we don't see any difference between nests with extra pair paternity and nests without extra pair paternity. So we have no evidence that this has anything to do with genetics at this point. We can't rule it out. Patty and I talked about this earlier, but, um, but we have no evidence that it is a genetic effect. We also have evidence suggesting that males, when they participate in extra pair fertilizations, don't pay any cost. So uh, on this graph, you've got on the left males that did not gain extra pair paternity. On the right, you have males that gained extra pair paternity. And the black and the white bars are young fledged from the within pair nest and within pair young sired. So you can see that the males that gained extra pair paternity did not pay a cost. 
But in the end, they ended up uh, doubling their reproductive success in those years. So, so the total number of young sired and the total number of young sired that fledged for those males that had extra pair of paternity was double that of the males that didn't. I put this in for Patty since she loves Bateman gradients. <laughs> so the upshot is it's, it's good to be an old male. So this has a, a potentially major demographic effect on decisions, even potentially early in life. It does regression line. What? Are they regression line? I believe so. Okay, just checking. Bateman didn't use a regression line. I think it's a GLMM okay. fitted values or something. Okay. So, so in any case, the number of offspring increases with the number of mates for males, but not for females. And we also have evidence that males sire more offspring as they age, independently of whether, you know, mixing everybody together, um, whether they had extra pair fertilizations or not. But so far, and we haven't published this because we actually need more data, we have found no benefits for females of extra pair fertilizations. And the one remaining thing that we need to look at is the sons, and we only had 25 sons whose paternity we also knew. Um, so, so we actually need about 10 more, we figured 10 more years of data to answer that question. Just tracking back through our, our blood samples that we already have at hand. So we, we looked at costs in terms of paternal care, and we found that it didn't matter what the male saw, he could see his a, a male come onto his territory or not, he could see his, his mate um, accept extra pair copulations, he didn't reduce his, his uh, effort at the nest. And when we look at the natural variation, we find that there's no relationship between extra pair paternity and male parental care. So for this piece of the research, I think it's a, a, still a big puzzle because we have this female preference for older males and we have uh, these males then <laughs> doubling their annual reproductive success and also with increased lifetime reproductive success. We have a phenotypic advantage in the nest where these males, these extra pair chicks are positioned early in the hatch sequence and they grow faster. We know that at day 14, if you're a larger chick, you have a longer lifespan. And so there's this then carryover effect, wherein these, these more viable extra pair offspring, by virtue of their position in the hatch sequence, end up living longer, and then they can have a higher probability of becoming these highly chosen uh, older males. And yet we have no evidence for a genetic effect in there at this point at all. So I'm gonna switch gears now before I come back and try to marry the two and talk about the in inclusive fitness benefits of helping at the nest. Does anybody have any question about what I've talked about so far? Is there age variation in the size of the, the eggs? Are, the, are, are the first eggs bigger? No. So in Eastern, they are. Oh. They get smaller. Huh. Interesting. No, we, we did check for that. And that's in the paper. Um. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be talking about inclusive fitness. Remember, we're talking direct and indirect fitness benefits. And I'll, I'll talk first about why sons stay in help. And then I'll come back and talk about why extra pair mating doesn't <coughs> reduce the benefits of helping the way people think it does, and then why extra pair mating might actually facilitate helping in ways that people haven't realized. So Janet, it might be useful to also say about the, the pattern of um, no withdrawal of parental care from males who have extra pair kids in their nails. That's a general finding. Now. It is a general finding. It's not. The reed warbler is an exception. Yeah. That's true. And, and they can't tell their kids apart. We've done cross-fostering, so it's not like they're discriminating within the nest either. That's a good point, thank you. 
So we have three kinds of helpers in Western bluebirds, but the, the most common kind of helper is that typical stay-at-home helper that you read about. We also have redirected helpers, which are males that have had their nests fail or lost a mate more commonly, and they'll go home and help at their parents' nests. But our third kind, I think, is really interesting because it's, it's males that are next door to their parents and they go back and forth between their parents' nest and their own nest within the same day. So they're feeding at both nests. Now these birds are living on independent territories. So if you have a father and son and their mates, I mean, they're sitting on wires, but they don't crisscross. There's a little bit more overlap if you map territories between relatives than non-relatives, but they are really main maintaining their own territories, except when these guys help and also my my grads my former grad student Caitlin Stern showed that there's cross territorial helping in these dire circumstances where you play a scream or um, where you put an intruder on the territory so you'll get sons or relatives coming in to help defend the territory even though they're maintaining territories of their own so I'll be talking first about direct fitness benefits, which can come through either the increased survival of the helper or through experience, whereby the helper gains experience as a helper, maybe learning to do things he would not otherwise do, that then enhances his reproductive success later on. And then indirect fitness benefits, which are increased production of non-descendant kin. So that means that's what I showed you earlier with uh, you know, the little birds on the slide where the parents are producing more offspring as a function of help. And then increased survival and reproductive success of the parents. And we're just going to look at survival because um, survival is really a large share for almost all animal species of lifetime reproductive success. Yes? So those we have never seen that. Are living at home and not right. It's possible that it's that it's simply philopatry. Right. Yeah. So nobody, everybody helps yeah. Yeah. So we can we can include prolonged brood care in that. We can include um, if you're if you're talking about survival, prolonged brood care, you know, nepotism, and and also territory quality, like they're staying on a higher quality territory. So I'll, I'll first talk about the direct fitness benefits. And the first thing we looked at was survival. And this is just survival to the next year. We haven't done the stage-based mark modeling to look at lifetime survival. Um, and what we find is absolutely no difference. So there's no, no evidence that helpers survive better on their natal territory in the first year anyway. And in terms of experience, um, we're looking again at reproduction as a two-year-old. Are they doing better if they help than if they bred independently? So are they staying home to learn something? And again, we, we really don't find any difference. In fact, we find the opposite. We find that helpers, and we don't find quality differences between helpers and their brothers that breed, so it doesn't appear to be that. But we find that, that if they help as a yearling, they have lower nesting success they have a, a lower number of fledglings in their first attempt, and they actually breed for about the same number of years as birds that bred as a yearling. So they're giving a, up a lot for not very much in that context of direct benefits. So what about indirect fitness benefits? Well, the first thing I want to say is we have pretty good evidence that kinship is important. Because when you look at the birds that are out there and who they've got to help, you see that they're 10 times as likely to help at when both their parents are there than if just one of their parents is there, like just their father, just their mother, or no parents, in which case they help at a brother's nest. So this suggests that that tendency to help, at least, is highly biased in favor of closer rather than more distant kin. And we also have evidence that they use vocalizations that they can actually recognize kin based on vocalizations. So we did playback experiments where we had a, kin, a, a recording from a, a son or a brother 
and an equidistant neighbor who was not related to the focal male. We played those songs in a balanced design, and I'm going to let you hear the Western Bluebirds song. It's not much of a song. Can you hear it? So that's one of the vocalizations we looked at. The other is a chatter call, which is really interesting because it's a call they give when there's an intrusion onto their territory and they're guarding and the male will like, join the female really close and give this chatter call and then they'll chase the intruder and then join the female again. And I just love this, this vocalization, so I have to play it. <laughs> is it too quiet or can you hear it? So you can picture them doing that and you know, frantically making this little chatter call. Yeah, that one, the, the first vocalization, it sounds a bit like the two-way contact calls of teachers. These are the, they're really contact calls, you know, they're flying around. Oh, yeah, well, the and two they're part. Not like, they're not like an Eastern song at all. Not at all. That two, they, the Westerns actually use the two when they're flying as a group up high, like, uh, to get water, but what you heard is the two and the chuck, which is the just the know, defense call, knitted together. Right, but it sounds more like the contact call. Yeah, I would consider that, I would say it's their know. dawn chorus. Yeah. So it's it's on average they have nine different twos and two different chucks, but they can have up to four different chucks. And so we anyway, so um, we've looked at uh, at recognition, and we find that. Um, even just from the playback, without any other information, uh, whether you're looking at flights at the speaker or the ch frequency of chatter call giving, um, they are more aggressive or more responsive to non-kin than to kin. Now, in order for indirect benefits to be important in the future, we would want to see some evidence of load lightning for the parents. So, uh, and that's exactly what we found. This is feeds per hour, so think of it as work done. And you see on the left, uh, the, the two left sets of bars. You have the breeding female, the breeding male, and they have a slight decrease in their feeding rate that is more than compensated for by the helper. So that the overall feeding rate is higher at the nest. And then we asked, does load lightning increase parents' survival to the next year? And we find nothing. Um, this doesn't mean it doesn't, you know, if we look over the course of their lifetimes, that it has no effect. But so far, we have no evidence for, for an indirect benefit through the parents. And I will come back to that. What about in the current nest? You've seen that the their feeding trips to the nest are, are more frequent when they have a helper, right? So the helpers are the white bars. And again, you see, just look at the right-hand set of bars, all three. The feeds per nestling per hour is also higher when they have a helper. So individual nestlings are getting more food at nests with helpers. Those nestlings tend to grow faster. And the fledgling, fledging success is higher with, at, an, at nests with helpers by 1.12 offspring. Now, we know there's an age bias in extra pair paternity, so it's possible that the costs for young males, I mean, 1.12 offspring isn't that many offspring, right? So the cost for those young males could be reduced. So we wanted to look at paternity in nests of helpers when they had their own nest and the nest of, of breeders and, nest, and the relatedness of, of helpers uh, to, to their parents' offspring, all of which can be affected by extra pair paternity. And what you see is that um, helper males have a slightly lower relatedness to the young in their own nest, but it's not much. And so when you do the fitness accounting for annual inclusive fitness of helping, w including those relatedness values, but not including any extra pair young that anybody might sire. What you see is a redirected helper does very badly 
0.08 offspring equivalents. A non-breeding helper gets 0.41 offspring equivalents. A breeder without help gets 2.41. So it's better to breed than it is to help. Um, a sim simultaneous breeder helper does just great with 3.75 offspring equivalents. And it's interesting that the, the mothers and the fathers would rank their sons' options just the same way the sons would in terms of fitness advantages. So that again puts us back to some, placing some evidence on the costs. What's going on here that they get the stay-at-home helpers get only 0.41 offspring equivalent. So much worse than breeding independently. And we tested for a shortage of females. And we did this with just three removals a year of either the eggs from a nest or at three nests, both the female and the eggs to see if those males would get a new mate. And we used very low sample sizes because if we were to remove 25, it's just not consistent with the low level of helping that we have, so it would be uninterpretable. We also, in another study, did male removals um, and, that were timed at the same, at the, during the same period, which is right after clutch completion for nests early in the season, so that there would be a chance for them to breed again. And what we found is that when we just removed the eggs, most of those males renested with new females. So they got new mates, and the one that didn't, um, the female had been killed. When we removed the mate, most of them didn't get a new mate, and two of them became helpers. One became a replacement male, which I haven't talked about yet, at a widowed female's nest. And then uh, one held a lone territory, and I can't remember what the other one did. In contrast, if you remove, ma if you remove males, you get replacement males very quickly. Or sometimes a couple of helpers that are out there, potential helpers, I should say, will come home and help their mother. So given do we still have slides up there? <laughs> okay. Has this been happening the whole time? No. Oh, good. <laughs> so, so in effect, what that removal experiment shows is that 0 0.41 is about, about on par with what they could hope to gain, except that it's an opportunistic behavior. They don't have to do it. They can just do it when they don't get another mate. And so it's really zero. If they don't get another mate, then they can go and help. So just in summary, helping's opportunistic. They appear to be helping because of a mate shortage, and they get an indirect fitness benefit in the current nest from helping. But we can't rule out other kinds of benefits that are accruing over the lifetime of males yet. So I'm going to talk briefly about why they live in kin neighborhoods. Actually, I think I'm, yeah, how's my time? You're fine. OK. All right, so I'm going to talk about access to resources as one possibility and nepotism as the other. And I want to mention that helping doesn't require staying home, because Re Renee Duckworth has a very nice study of Western bluebirds in Montana, where I think there's been one winter record since the beginning of the Christmas bird count. So everybody migrates, basically. And, and they still have helpers. So it's not a prerequisite. What's necessary is that they form kin neighborhoods, that they're in the same area at the time of breeding, and that they know who each other is. So mistletoe offered a really nice opportunity to look at a resource effect at the time of year when these birds are living in these family groups on the natal territory of the of the help, potential helper males. And so we went out and we measured the volume of mistletoe on 3,377 trees on the study area. In other words, every tree with mistletoe within 200 meters of the nest box. And then we did an experiment where we 
set up a matched pair of 13 territories that were experimental and 13 controls and removed half the mistletoe from the experimental territories. And our prediction was that the suns on those territories would be less likely to stay home. So this is what that looked like. And we monitored over the course of the summer and we did not see any evidence that parents are evicting their offspring. So it looks like it, you know, if, if something happens, it's, it's really uh, effectively a behavioral choice on the part of the sun. And you can see uh, the right-hand tree, we've clipped out some of the mistletoe. So we added up the volumes, figured out what we needed to take down, and then took down what we could to make half. Uh, some of the clumps are obviously too high to climb to. And what we found is that we literally or nearly wiped out delayed dispersal on these territories. So it's a, probably the most dramatic. I, I have a lot of negative results over the course of my career, and I think any honest scientist does. This is the most dramatic result I've ever had. And uh, so it was pretty exciting, and we got all cocky about it and published it. And, and then, you know, I realized, well, the sons left, but their parents stayed behind. So we can't rule out that their parents are also important. So I became really interested in the interaction between the two. And it turned out that the parents, and this is going to become important later, there's a threshold below which they would not stay. And that was 15, a mean of 15.9, but if you go up two standard errors, 29 cubic meters of mistletoe. We also did some studies that showed that female parents are nepotistic. I'm just going to show you what their behaviors look like that we measured. They're less aggressive to their sons and daughters than they are to immigrants that have joined their groups. So we took five years of observational data where we did year-round field work and used those data to test for an interaction between the amount of mistletoe they have on their territory and what happens to the sons, but also the presence of the parents, zero, one, or both parents. And what surprised me was um, in the first step of dispersal, which is the one we measured in the experiment, we found a strong effect of parents and no effect of mistletoe, none at all. And I mean, this is one of those lessons for me as a, as a scientist, because to me, the gold standard in animal behavior, especially field studies of animal behavior, is the experiment. I love field experiments. And yet, we have this great discrepancy between our observational data and, and the field experiments. So I had to sort of think about why that would be. And if you think about it, in the experiment, we took the amount of mistletoe down to 40 cubic meters. And we were asking, instead of two birds, to stay on that territory. We were asking three or four birds to stay on that territory. The natural territories had a mean of 71%. And so what we think is that we went below some threshold there where the suns couldn't stay. But when you look at the natural variation, you don't see that same effect. And the parents are really important. almost always one. Now they will, they will re-nest, but in about half of the years they have second nests, but it's only less than 20% of the birds that would have a second nest, pairs that would have a second nest. Very different from your population. You have up to five broods, is that right? Yeah, but that's rare. Three is common. Yeah. And what's really interesting Oh, that is interesting. That's, that's interesting, yeah. So it's like food sharing during the nesting cycle or something. Anyway, we can talk about it later. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, um, so the, the other surprise was winter survival was ridiculous. This is, I think, as far as I've been able to find, the highest 
over winter survival for any, any bird species that's been studied. The, other, the closest that I'm aware of is 67%. And this is with MARC modeling. So this provided a great opportunity for us because, you know, at first I was like, what? There's no variation. We can't look at the effects of parents and resources. But what we were then able to do is, is say, okay, well, everybody survives up until the second step, step of dispersal. Let's see who leaves and who goes. And so we did that same interaction, same analysis with, with parents and, and um, resources for the second step. And there we found a strong effect of parents, that's the top graph, and a strong effect of mistletoe. And these are the fitted values. And interestingly, there was an interaction. So if they went to some other territory, they tended not to stay. And actually, the more mistletoe there was, the less likely they were to stay, which I found pretty interesting. The key here is that the vo and this is, this is looking at the volume on the winter territory. So it's a different volume than for the first step of dispersal, where we were looking at the volume on the spring territory. Because you want to really go with what they have right before they make that decision. So, so what's interesting is that we did find territorial budding. So sons got a portion of that winter territory that the family group held. And the more mistletoe the parents had, or the group had, um, the more mistletoe those sons got on their, on their territories. So they're on their independent breeding territories and they get 80% of their mistletoe from the parents' territory. But the parents don't concede um, an equal share to the sons to what they keep. So per area, the parents keep more than they give to their sons. So they're giving them a relatively poor part of their territory, but they get to start life with something for the next winter. And so what we think about this is that, that um, you know, one of the benefits for sticking around is that you get a territory with some mistletoe. So overall, we have benefits of, of localized dispersal in that the, the males get some mistletoe of their own. They have very high overwinter survival throughout the study area. So there's probably more variance between large areas of coastal oak woodland than there is within our study area. And they get a potential, at least, if they, if they can't breed on their own for a small indirect fitness bump. So now I want to quickly bring these bodies of research together and talk about how extra pair paternity affects things like territory budding, or at least how extra pair paternity and inclusive fitness theory affect it. One thing that inclusive fitness theory allows us to hypothesize is that if you're a son nesting near relatives, especially your father given that extra pair paternity advantage that is conferred to older males, that you, and this is Caitlin Stern's modeling work, one of my former graduate students, is that if you're gonna lose and you have a high probability of losing when you're a young male, it's better to lose to your father than it is to lose to a non-relative. And without inclusive fitness theory, we would never even generate that hypothesis. The other thing I wanna talk about is the monogamy hypothesis, which was put for, for, for use social insects by Boomsma, but has been transferred to mammals and also to birds with phylogenetic analyses, looking at transitions into and out of cooperative breeding over evo evolutionary time. This hypothesis doesn't actually work for cooperative breeding systems where you have extra pair paternity and male helpers because if a, male, um, if a male helper's parent, father loses paternity in his nest, the helper, especially in our system, is probably more likely to lose it. And he's related to his own offspring by zero. Uh, not his own offspring, but the offspring in his own nest that are sired by an extra pair male. Whereas he's at least related to the offspring in his parents' nest, even if they're extra pair kids, by one half. So that creates a really interesting asymmetry. And so 
we, we generated a new hypothesis, the delayed extra pair of benefits hypothesis, which we think could apply to species like the fairy wrens that have ridiculous levels of extra pair fertilizations and have presented a paradox for cooperative breeding. So a helper in staying home and increasing his own survival could gain from late life extra pair paternity. We have no evidence that they increase their survival, but as I said, we haven't tested for long-term survival, which is what's important to this hypothesis. And helping can increase the father's survival and stamina later in life, leading to an indirect fitness benefit for that helper. So Caitlin has become, begun to model this um, just this month. Um, and this is our delayed extra pair of benefits model. This is one model result. So on the y-axis, you see inclusive fitness. And on the, uh, I'm sorry, on the z-axis, you see inclusive fitness. On the x-axis, you see the effect of male age on the number of offspring sired. And then you have the father's age minus the son's age, that differential, which we've shown isn't very important in Western bluebirds in terms of paternity. But what you see is that that age differential is not that important, but, but that the effect of male age on the number of offspring sired can be quite important. The uh, orange is the yearling male that's helping, the blue surface is the yearling male that's breeding, and there's a crossover point that's fairly consistent across most age differences between fathers and sons. So we're... Um, continuing to work on this model and then hoping to get a long term, longer series of paternity years so that we can test using mark modeling with survival and actual paternities, the, this hypothesis. So our main conclusions are that suns stay because of mistletoe and the potential for budding off a a piece of territory with mistletoe and then there are things we can't measure yet because we don't have the tools which is you know there are probably costs of moving along a long distance to find a territory or a place to breed or a female plus costs of working your way into a winter group in another sort of population of western bluebirds. Suns help because of indirect fitness benefits and a shortage of females and then extra pair paternity creates these unusual opportunities for current, um, current and, and future fitness benefits. And I just want to make a plea for long-term studies. They provide really kind of fun opportunities for synthesis once you have time to actually do some synthesis. And they account for inter, inter uh, annual variation, which I think is just missing from a lot of uh, short-term studies, and, and we've discovered that it ends up being really important. Um, it allows you to correct yourself, and I think that's my favorite thing about it. Um, it's caused me to be a little bit skeptical about studies that are not repeated or conducted over the short term. And with the new technologies that are coming on board, essentially we're gonna have this fantastic opportunity to combine genomics with complete demography, you know, once we are able to track electronically these <coughs> small birds over long distances in the kinds of numbers that we really need to be able to do. So thank you very much. Yeah, we looked at that and it's not, with, with the microsatellites, we were able to look at that. So females that are mating with multiple males don't have higher heterozygosity than if they just mate with a single no. male? No. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that. 
they, they're, I think it has to do with in, they don't have lower heterozygosity with their own mate. And, and actually, they don't, so overall, they will, right? But their heter, their, the heterozygosity they would achieve with the extra pair male is not greater than with their win, within pair male. Yeah, I guess what I'm getting at is. Um, so, so it's gene general genetic diversity uh, argument. A female that's mating with a, an intermediate quality male certainly must benefit if she mates with a higher quality male uh, if he comes in for an EPC. And so I'm, I'm sort of just thinking what about. What is quality? Uh, male with a better quality territory. But what he does, she doesn't necessarily benefit from his territory because well, she doesn't have. She has a son that potentially can hold a better quality male or a better quality territory. Sorry. Yeah, that there's a whole chain of things that have to be true for that to be true. But I, but I do. I mean, I agree with you. We did look for for heterozygosity effects, but um, and we're terribly surprised and that that we're not finding a female benefit. But you have. But it, it's still possible that we would find, with 25 sons, I mean, yes, we analyzed it, but we just aren't convinced it's not a, a, a big enough sample. S uh, 25 sons that became breeders where we could look at their reproductive success. I have a process question. Um, how do they know all this? <laughs> I mean, how did, I mean is, it, is it auditory signals? Is it smell? I mean, what, what, how do they know who's who? That's a great question. So there is this, the, the vocalization, but what's interesting about the vocalization, what our, I didn't talk about our, our next paper that came out on that, which is there is no vocal signature that's family specific. They share as many songs with a nearby relative, or I guess slightly more with a nearby relative than a nearby non-relative. Um, but if their son disperses pretty far away, they, there's, a, there's a, um, an attenuation of song sharing with distance, even with their sons. So what we think they're, they're doing is they're getting to know the vocalizations of individuals at the nest, in the winter groups, in the neighborhood. And so far we know that they can tag age information and kinship information to that. So this opens up the possibility of this whole study of them having a vocal spatial map of the neighborhood. And I've always believed they had that um, because of behaviors we've seen, things they've detected that they shouldn't have. Steve. Uh, <clears throat> if they prefer older males, I can think of two possible benefits. One is that the males have survived maybe yes. dealing with diseases that uh, you know, other males that died didn't do right. well. They also might be more experienced at, as you know, feeders of their kids. I don't know if that's been looked at. Well, I'm trying to think. We must have analyzed have, that at some have, point. Uh, the feeding rates or better food quality? But the extra fair males the, not be yeah. feeding the kids. Well, I the don't main, know. I, I they aren't. How much they aren't. Okay. No, they're not feeding the kids, and we don't have any evidence that they later become mates or anything okay. like that. But, but there probably is an age effect. It may, I don't know what the threshold is or how long, you know, what the, what the curve looks like. But there probably is an age effect on, on feeding. Yes? This is a crazy idea. <laughs> Well, so it, I mean, one of our hypotheses was that they're timing their copulations. It's not really so much early in the season as it is they, when the female's about to lay eggs, right? So that they capture those and then put their efforts someplace else. So, so I think that's that's very possible. I mean, and it's certainly consistent with yeah. And it's very consistent with our, our data on, on intrusions, 
uh, timing of intrusions and things like that. I have one question related to my crazy idea. The, is the, the order of hatching, is there a sex bias? No. Nope. Do males? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay thank no, it's a good question. We did, we did test for that, yeah. Yes? So the simultaneous strategy seems like an excellent one. I was just wondering why might that not be more common? I mean, are there not that many opportunities, or is it really energetically costly? Or? Um, I would think it would be kind of costly if they're, if they're still contributing half the feeding trips to the nest at home, um, which I think they are. <laughs> But we have very few of those. And, and you know, the truth is, I haven't gone back. You know, the, one of the things you need to do with a long-term study is like go back and reanalyze everything again. I just haven't had the uh, time to do that. But, but uh, it'd be very good to look at them. Yes? One last follow-up thing. So in, in thinking about this runaway system, and you said, so it's the most sex bias to this first patch of kids. But what if you can to your daughters, the preference for the, the Absolutely. So that, that virtuous cycle, so basi basically that virtuous cycle with viability selection in there and, and the crossover, it, it, it's very consistent with what you're saying. And, and it becomes, how do you test it? Well, yeah, you need a long time series of years with total population paternity analysis. But, but yeah, I'm really interested. When I put that together, I went, wow, this is amazing. I mean, it could be cultural, it could be genetic, but it's an amazing pattern to just see that, you know, those relationships just carry all the way through back to extra pair mate choice. Yes? You didn't mention uh, whether fathers help sons out, which seems from an inclusive fitness point of view, like it would be just as good. Is there an obvious reason that doesn't happen? Sorry? So sons are helping their parents, right? but you don't have fathers ever helping their sons? Right. So the indirect fitness benefit of helping parents is, is pretty small. And, and because the ones that do help appear to be constrained from breeding independently, it's so small compared to how good it would be to breed independently, and that's true for the father too. The father, it's probably even worse to become a non-breeding helper. But why they don't kind of sometimes help across territories we haven't seen them do it, that's all I can say. But, you know, I think you're right. There, there is, you know, if they, it, it is something that they could potentially do. Is that typical of birds if they don't have grandparental care? Sorry? Is it typical of birds if they don't have grandparental care like that? Yeah, I think it is fairly typical. So we have had the other way around. So in one of those removals, what I didn't tell you guys, the, the female removals, that son went and helped at his parents' nest, and their, his mother was killed, which I think really helps to support the female shortage hypothesis because he and his dad went 500 meters away to the grandfather's nest and helped there for the rest of the season, and then all three of those males were at that nest the following season. So it persists. The effect of that one removal compounded by the death of the mother led to helping over two years at a grandfather's nest. Janice, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. So it's just